In part one of this series, we saw that God revealed himself and advanced his plan through covenants that he made with us humans. Now, like the ancient covenants, the ones that God made with us were imposed sovereignly. There wasn't some mutual negotiation going on. And they required obedience and submission from us. Blessings were promised as long as the covenant was kept. But if it's broken, uh, there's the shedding of blood. That is the death of the one who already had no right to life. In part two, we looked at the two covenants that God made with us humans. Uh, in Eden, before Adam's sin, there was the covenant of works. Now, this creation covenant required complete and personal obedience to everything God commanded. That's why when Adam ate the fruit of the tree that God had forbidden him to eat from, he experienced spiritual death. That is complete separation from fellowship with God his creator. And he would also experience physical death. Now, after the fall of Adam, God imposed his covenant of grace. A promised Messiah would come to crush the evil tempter and deliver God's people. The debt that we owed and we deserved was paid for in full by our Savior Jesus Christ. The faith that makes us trust in God's provision is in itself an unearned gift of grace. Now, the covenant of grace is just one covenant. Yet it was administered in various ways down through history. Westminster Confession calls these administrations dispensations of the covenant. That's in Westminster Confession, chapter 7, sections 5 and 6. So it's just one covenant, but in the different periods of redemptive history, it was dispensed differently. And that's what the word dispensation means, a dispensing. There were different men used as covenant mediators between God and his people. And there were expanding degrees of revelation and symbolisms of that one covenant. So the continuity of the promises show the oneness of this sovereign administration. But there are several promises uh, that God gave us, several warnings. But there are specific principles that are promised in every redemptive era. One of those is what we call the Emmanuel Principle. <clears throat> God assures his people that he will be present with them to be their God and to declare them to be his people. Now, one of the names given to God in Hebrew is Immanuel. Uh, it's actually two separate words in Hebrew. We say Emmanuel. It combines the prepositional form with us, which is Imanu, with the word for God, El. Together they mean with us, God. It's a designation for God as he stands in covenantal presence among his people. Now, the same name is given prophetically to Jesus in Isaiah 7:14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. This verse was actually quoted by the angel to Joseph when he learned that Mary was going to give birth to the promised Messiah. That's in Matthew chapter 1. Now, this clear unifying idea is always present when God marks out his people in all the ages. Fundamental to the covenant concept is the idea of subjugating undeserving people under a sovereign king's care and protection, and then expecting allegiance from them, showing loyalty and obedience to the king. The primary work of salvation is God restoring fallen people to a state of holiness by atonement and redemption so that they might be reconciled with God again. Now, the merits of the Messiah's substitutionary death, the recipients of grace are restored to fellowship with God. He becomes their God, and they become his people in a way unique from the whole remainder of the lost human race. This fundamental covenant union hasn't changed all through history. <clears throat> God, for example, revealed this basic redemptive promise to Abraham in this covenantal form. In Genesis 17, verse 7, he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Now the Lord, using the covenant name Jehovah or Yahweh, spoke to Moses and to the nation of Israel in his time, and he showed that same unique relationship. And here it is in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. He said, then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. And then the verse goes on and says, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
And then in Deuteronomy 4.20, it says, The Lord has taken you and brought you out from the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. <clears throat> in the period of the kings, God spoke similarly by the prophets. Second Kings 11.17, it says, Then Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the, and the king of the people that they should be the Lord's people. Ezekiel 34.24, it says, And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be prince among them, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Zechariah 8.8 8, And I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they will be my people, and I will be their God, in truth and righteousness. Then, foreshadowing the age of the Messiah, when he delivered us, God said in Zechariah 2.11, Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day, and will become my people. And I will dwell in your midst, and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. This Emmanuel principle is very clearly applied in the union of God with his church in the New Testament, after the great revealing of God being with us in the person of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 8.10, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6.16, 6, Just as God said, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The basic promise and benefit of God's covenant of grace has always been the same in every era. But there's also a consistent promise of a Messiah. The way of becoming a child of God has always been the same since the time of Adam. It's always been a work of God's grace and of that alone. It was always based on the satisfaction of the sins of specific individuals by that one Messiah, Jesus Christ. That grace removes sin and its guilt by judicially satisfying it. The redeemed person is then reconciled together with God, restoring that lost fellowship with his Creator. This repaired separation transforms spiritual death into spiritual life. It produces a true saving faith, a sincere repentance, and a desire to obey God thankfully. These works of faith and repentance are the means by which God works on our hearts. God restores these abilities in us to fulfill what he decreed concerning our redemption. We are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not because of anything found in our fallen nature that we could conjure up on our own. That's made explicitly clear in Ephesians 2.8 and 1 Corinthians 2.14. So the promise of grace was made first way back in the time of Adam. The seed of Satan would be destroyed by the woman's seed, not by anything they earn, but by God's sovereign decree. In Genesis 3.15, it said, And he shall bruise you on the head, speaking to the serpent, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now at the ceremony where God ratified his covenant with Abraham, that same foundation of grace is evident. It's not Abraham's righteousness alone. It didn't come from his own merits. But it was credited to him by the Lord, the Lord in whom Abraham had put his trust. In Genesis 3, or 15, 6, it says, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So when God put that faith in his heart, and he trusted in these promises of the covenant, God reckoned righteousness to him, the righteousness of the future Messiah. <clears throat> now in Romans 4, the Apostle Paul details how the covenant of God with Abraham was not founded on any works of the patriarch at all. It rested wholly upon that which God himself provided and which was evident in the faith implanted in his heart. There in Romans he quotes from Genesis 15:6, as we just read. In Romans 4, 2, Paul said, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, he didn't have anything to boast in at all. It was all by God's sovereign grace. David understood that his blessings were not the results of works or personal merit, too. Back in Psalm 32, 1, he said, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So these are clearly represented as God's acts, not anything earned or deserved by David. And Paul quoted David from Psalm 32. Uh, he interpreted David's testimony unambiguously in Romans 4, 
beginning at verse 6. Uh, he had a whole section. Let me read a portion of it. David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. So the faith that God produced in the Old Testament believers looked to God to provide for the removal of their guilt. They trusted that the suffering servant would one day pay the judicial debt of his people. Isaiah 52 on through 53, 12. <clears throat> Let me read one portion of that here from verses 4 to 6 in Isaiah 53, clearly referring to Jesus. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. <clears throat> now at the Last Supper, Jesus spoke of the cup of Passover, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Matthew 26. Now, though the word new, kenos, is not in all the ancient Greek manuscripts, it does not mean a new covenant to replace an old previous one. The term means a renewed form of the one covenant of grace. Before the death of Christ, the old relationship with God was demonstrated through sacrifices. They were performed by faith in God's promise that one would come to die in their place, that promise way back in Genesis. When Jesus was sacrificed, a new relationship began, since he fulfilled what the sacrifices represented. It became a newly fulfilled form of the same covenant. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 to 29, Paul quoted from Genesis 15, 6 about Abraham again. Uh, then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he added, uh, in those who are of faith, they are the sons of Abraham. And in Genesis 15, 8, all nations shall be blessed in you. So this new relationship uh, the Messiah would fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham and extend it to include God's people in all nations as originally promised, not just Israel. God's whole argument here through Paul is to show this unity of the covenant. <clears throat> Galatians 3.29, it says, If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. This newly fulfilled relationship we have through the risen Savior is detailed all through the New Testament, particularly in the books of Hebrews, especially chapter 11, Romans, Ephesians, Galatians. This is one gospel. The promised one, Jesus Christ, would satisfy divine justice for his people as a perfect vicarious sacrifice. He would embrace, or his work, rather, embraced by faith, uh, was made possible by the work of grace. He even plants that faith in our hearts, in the hearts of those he redeems. Both the Old and New Testaments build on this same idea. In every age since the fall, man has only been justified in one way, by grace, through faith, never by works, never by his own abilities. Man's total depravity begins way back at the fall. Romans chapter 5 shows that very clearly. The promises of grace as the cause of faith, didn't begin with the New Testament either. Therefore, every Old Testament believer was saved not by works, but by God's sovereign grace working in his heart, giving him that faith. And it's on the basis of the salvation provided by the coming Messiah and applied by the instrumentality of God's gift of faith that they would trust in that promise and be made the children of God. Now, although there's one covenant <clears throat> and it's dispensed in different ways, there is a unity in the parties of the covenant. In every era, the covenant is between God and his chosen people. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, this is a long portion, but I think it really illustrates it well from verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. 
The Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So the promise of the covenant was made by God to the descendants of Adam. Uh, that's found in several verses. Uh, for example, Genesis 15:18, It says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And then in Exodus 20, verse 5, he said, You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. <clears throat> so there's that uh, continuity between the generations, all relating to God's covenant. The same promise is extended to believers in the New Testament. It's not a new promise, but a renewed understanding of the old one. It's a new form and administration of a promise that extends all the way back to Eden. With reference to the ancient promise, Peter spoke to the church after the death of Christ in Acts 2.39. He said, For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, and many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. So there it is. Brings together that Old Testament promise, and it shows that we are the parties of that covenant, along with our God. Now, uh, the ancient promise was not just something temporary, not temporal. It was intended by God to be perpetual. There's a grafting in of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish nations, into that covenant nation of God's promise. And way back in Genesis 7:13, it says, A servant who is born in your house or who is brought in with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus my covenant uh, be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So Paul spoke concerning the nature of God's covenant people in Romans 11. And here he really spells it out clearly in this whole chapter. But beginning at verse 17, he said, and he's speaking here of this tree which represents the, the, the good olive tree of his people being grafted into it. <clears throat> and the other tree is the wild olive tree, the olive tree of the world says, if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Now, this means, of course, that there were some who left Israel because of their unbelief. But then some in that wild olive tree, the Gentiles, were grafted in by God's grace and become partakers of the same tree, one tree. Since the promise is associated with descendants, dying without children was considered to be tragic. Would the suffering Messiah die without seed, without children? Well, it may appear so at first, since Jesus was crucified with no children. But we who are grafted in by grace are that seed, the seed of the Messiah, his spiritual children. It's interesting just to compare Isaiah 53, 8 with 53, 10. It says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Then in verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his seed, his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So we are that seed of Messiah, those who are his children, saved by his grace. Now, there's unity in the different stages of this covenant as it was renewed. God, the sovereign party of the covenant, never changes. In each age, though there were new covenant mediators, chosen humans who were representatives of the people. Uh, and, of course, since people die, these covenant mediators had to be replaced. A uh, beautiful study of this is Dr. Robert Vinoy's book, Covenant Renewal at Gilgal. But for each covenant mediator, the covenant was sealed by slain animals, which represented the coming Savior who would be slain in our place. And that's how covenants were always sealed, representing in that death of the animals what was deserved by the covenant breakers, but by God's promise will be paid for by the future coming Messiah. <clears throat> Adam, God's promise uh, in the providing of skins of slain animals provided that covering. 
in Genesis 3.21 when uh, he and Eve had uh, sinned and they could not see the glory of God all over them and they saw their naked bodies not, and no longer being able to perceive that glory of God in all things. And for Noah, Genesis 8, verse 20, it says the rainbow and the sacrificed animals uh, were there to represent the covenant after the flood. And with Abraham, uh, Genesis 15, there was a literal dividing of Adam's, or Adam, yeah, animals' bodies uh, in order to seal that covenant with Abram. And then with Samuel, there was covenant renewal that took place at Gilgal. And what took place? The sacrifice of peace offerings, 1 Samuel 11 and 12. And of course with Jesus, that great covenant mediator who declared himself to be the Lamb of God. And he was put to death as the final sacrifice at Calvary. So those are the different mediators showing the different periods of time uh, when God was uh, dealing with people. <clears throat> and notice, each time the covenant was renewed. Not a new covenant, but a covenant renewal uh, as they sacrificed animals. And that's what was done with the ancient covenants. When the covenant representative of the people would die, then there was a new ceremony uh, of a new covenant mediator. Or when a king dies, another covenant was, or the covenant was renewed with the successor to the king. And that's how God kept the covenant going, renewing it each time uh, in order that he might assure his people and advance their understanding of this promise that would be fulfilled in the Messiah. But there's also diversity in God's covenant. Of course, one of the diversities is a progress in how much is revealed, how much we learn about God and about his promises and his decrees. The work of the Messiah was made known progressively. In the Old Testament, atonement was depicted by the increasingly precise system of sacrifices. They represented the judicial death of the sinner through a promised substitute. Obediently presenting the sacrifices with full faith, confidence in the promise of God, demonstrated that work of God's grace in their hearts. Now, after the death of Jesus, sacrifices were replaced. They were replaced by a commemorative sealing sacrament, the Lord's Supper. Now, like the sacrifices, it's a symbol, a means of God's grace and an obedience. So in partaking in true saving faith, the believer is reminded of the body and blood of our Lord shed for us, and we're assured that by God's promise, we can be regenerated children of God by grace. And he's made us spiritually alive to grow in Christ's likeness. Now, the pre-resurrection sign of the covenant was circumcision. It represented the removal of moral defilement by a bloody cutting away, a bloody sign. And those who took this sign in faith were counted as members of God's covenant people, outwardly, of course. It was only to be given to adult males if they made a credible profession of faith but then the same sign was to be placed on all the male infants born to them who showed that, to show that they too were members of the covenant people. Those Jews uh, who then denied the covenant after they were circumcised were cut off from Israel by a judicial process. Now, the post-resurrection sign of the covenant is baptism. It marks out the members of God's covenant people outwardly. It's given only to those adults who make a credible profession of faith. But it's also administered, as was circumcision, to the children of baptized parents. Shows that they are members outwardly of the covenant family. It doesn't speak to their salvation. Now the male represented Christ in the home as its head and representative to God. That's made clear in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. But after the cross, husbands continued that representative role, but to show fulfillment of the covenant sacrifice in Christ, the bloody sign was no longer appropriate. And so females also received the sign of baptism. Now, <clears throat> the, the place of convocational worship also changed and progressed uh, so that we would depict God's presence among us differently. At first, group worship was done by families. Then under Moses, it became centralized in the tabernacle. And God's presence among his worship beca worshipers became even more realized in the time of Solomon in the great temple. But Jesus lifted the local limits of convocational worship so that it would take place in all the churches all around the world. In John 4, beginning at verse 21, Jesus said, Woman, believe me, 
An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so to drive this home, when Jesus was crucified and resurrected, the veil in the temple was rent. It was torn, showing entry into that holy place through Messiah. Then the covenant temple itself, which had become corrupted in the time of Christ, was finally destroyed in 70 A.D. And that's what I believe is described in Matthew 23 and 24. Now, though there's diversity in each era, there's no sharp division into separate covenants of God. The Exodus took place actually under the Abrahamic form of the covenant established uh, way back in the time of Abraham. The law of Moses and all its Levitical ceremonies were not given to Israel until they gathered at Sinai. And so the Passover and the whole Exodus took place under the Abrahamic form of the covenant, not under the promises and practices later to given uh, to Israel at Sinai in the Mosaic Law. In Exodus 6, 8, before all that took place, God said, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So the deliverance of Israel under Moses was the basis even for the law that was given later. And that deliverance under the Abrahamic promise became the foundation for the Ten Commandments and all the commandments of God that were given to his covenant people. That unity of the covenant continues on, even though there's a diversity. Now, preface to the Ten Commandments, it says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And so what follows in Exodus 20 is a therefore. It's based upon the promise anciently made before the time of Moses. The term dispensation is used to describe the various administrations or dispensing of this one covenant. The blessings were dispensed by a succession of covenant mediators whom God raised up. It was administered in different ways, through the patriarchs, then the judges, then the kings and prophets. And after the resurrection of Jesus, we learn in the New Testament, it's to be administered first by the apostles and continuing on by ordained church officers as shepherds and teachers of his people. But still, always under the mediatorship of the resurrected Savior, each administration expanded on the ones before it, but it was one covenant. The covenant rule of God includes a progressing revelation realizing God's eternal decree. In each period, we learn more about God's plan and about His grace. It has always been based upon one eternal and unchanging purpose of God. The covenant of God's grace his redemptive covenant is singular. The work of God is a unity, proclaiming a plan which will not be fully revealed before the final day of judgment and the return of Jesus and the coming consummation of the ages. Now, uh, God is eternal, and he knows all things. It was his providence that drove human history to produce that perfect form for revealing and implementing his plan of redemption, the covenant form. Understanding that covenant structure that God used clears up much of the confusion about the Bible's message. It helps us understand how much we owe to our loving and sovereign God. In the person of Jesus Christ, he took on himself what we deserved, our guilt and its just penalty. He makes undeserving sinners to become his forgiven children, brought into his kingdom when he could have had them killed. And he puts saving faith in the hearts of all those who by their fallen nature will not, cannot believe in him without that work of grace. I was coming a day when, you know, we'll all understand this far better than we do now. But our assignment here and now is to live obediently, and to worship him humbly, thankfully, and prayerfully. We have this confidence. God never fails to do everything he's promised. When we're taken in by his undeserved grace, he will never let us go.